Good morning, McLean. My name is Mrs. Gonzalez, and today I'd like to tell you a story I read in a book by Simon Singh called The Code Book. It's the story of a cowboy who amassed a vast fortune, a buried treasure worth $40 million, and a mysterious set of encrypted papers. Our tale begins in the year 1820, in the Washington Hotel in Lynchburg, Virginia. The Washington was a fancy hotel, the classiest establishment in town, owned by a man named Robert Morris. Morris was, by all reports, a great host, friendly, perceptive, a gifted businessman, and naturally confident. People recalled about him that everyone who stayed in his hotel felt at ease when Morris was around. Her tale features a particular guest at Morris's hotel, a man by the name of Thomas J. Beale. By the look of his clothes and the dark tan of his face, Morris could tell that Beale was a cowboy. But in the three months he lived at the Washington, Beale never explained what he was doing in Virginia, where there were no cattle to be wrangled. He was pleasant to have around, and the other guests liked him, and they were all happy to see him return in January of the next year. His second visit was as friendly as the first, and even more mysterious because the second time Thomas J. Beale left the Washington Hotel, he entrusted Robert Morris with a locked box, which he said contained valuable papers. Several months later, Beale sent Morris a letter telling him to keep the box safe from all harm. If Beale did not return to collect the box within 10 years, he said, then Morris was to open the box and read a message that Beale had written for him inside. In addition to that letter, Beale told Morris, there would be three other important documents in the box that could only be read with a key, and a friend of Beale's would deliver that key to Morris. Ten years went by, and Beale never returned to Virginia to claim the box. Morris, afraid to invade his privacy, waited 23 years before opening it. When he did, he found the note Beale had left for him, explaining the truth of his mysterious appearance in Lynchburg. In the year 1817, the letter explained, Beale was part of a hunting and exploring expedition that took him across America to the little town of Santa Fe, New Mexico. North of town, in a dry creek bed, Beale's companions discovered a ravine of gold. For 18 months, their crew mined the gold, but they worried about how to keep their new riches safe. It was agreed that Beale would take the gold to Virginia, where many of the men had family, and hide it in a secure location. The crew wanted to keep the stash of gold a secret, but worried that if no one but themselves knew of it, and an accident should happen to them in the Wild West, their treasure would be lost, and it wouldn't do anyone any good. So they instructed Beale to be on the lookout in his trip to Virginia, to find a trustworthy, unselfish person with whom they could share their secret. During his two stays at the Washington Hotel, Beale had been delighted to meet a man like Robert Morris and determined that he was the one who should guard the secret about where the treasure was hidden. As he read that letter, Morris was humbled by the trust Beale had placed in him all those years ago. He wanted to do whatever he could to make sure the treasure was found and distributed to the remaining family members of Beale's gang. But here was the problem. The papers Beale had left behind that explained the location of the treasure were in code. The key Beale had promised to send was not a physical key at all, but an encryption key. An encryption key is a piece of information that is needed to reveal a message in code. So I'll explain. This message here, if you saw it without a key, you would have no idea what it says. But if someone showed you this key, which shows which each letter represents in the code, it would only take you a minute to discover that the secret code says, good morning, McLaren. Another example of a key, a little bit more complicated, is called a book cipher. And in a book cipher, two people who want to communicate in code just need access to the same edition of the same book. They also need to decide whether they're going to encode their message by letter or by whole word. Once that's decided, um, the code will just look like a random string of numbers. Okay, so imagine two generals are trying to send a message about the location of enemy troops. And imagine they decided to use 
page 103 of the sixth grade ancient history textbook as their code book. One of them would write down 323, 111, 2, 256, 211, 259, 238. And the other would know that those sets of three letters would show him the words he needed. So he'd turn to the same page of the book and he would go to the third paragraph, the second line, and the third word in the line and write down military. Then he'd go to the first full paragraph, the eleventh line, and the second word and write down marching, and so on and so forth, until he discovered the message military marching behind the ruined city. This code is wonderfully easy to use if you know the book, the page, and whether the numbers stand for whole words or just letters. But Robert Morris, looking at the papers Beale had left behind, had no idea what book he would have used. And for 20 years, he worried and worked at it, but made no progress. When Morris was 84 years old and worried that his time might soon be up, he passed the secret on to a friend. We don't know who this friend was, but we do know that he wrote down everything he knew about the Beale treasure in a short pamphlet and had the pamphlet published. Because he wrote that pamphlet, the mysterious friend is known to people who study the Beale treasure simply as the author. The author studied the three encoded pages and eventually made some progress. He used the Declaration of Independence as a codebook. Each number in the code text on the second page of the BL papers represented the first letter of every tenth word in the declaration. With this information, the author was able to decipher the second of Beale's three pages. That page described the vault in which the gold is buried and how it's all laid out within the vault. It also explains the amount of gold that is hidden, and in today's money, the gold hidden in Beale's vault would be worth about $43 million. Once he knew how much that treasure was worth, the author devoted his life to cracking the code of the other two pages. In his pamphlet, he recounts that he spent every dollar he had looking for the gold and lost his happiness and his reputation in the process. He made no more progress and heartbroken, he gave up the quest. His pamphlet made the treasure and the code public knowledge in 1885. People from all over took up the challenge to crack the code and find the treasure. Two brothers, George and Clayton Hart, were so confident they had found the spot, they blasted a few dynamite holes in and around Lynchburg. Herbert Yardley, who was the head of American code breaking in World War I, worked on deciphering the Beale papers for many years. Military leaders in the Signal Intelligence Corps would assign younger soldiers to work on the code as a way to sharpen their skills. In the year 1860, the Beale Cipher and Treasure Association was founded, and anyone could join who promised to share the treasure if they found it. By the year 1970, professional code breakers estimated that 10% of all the finest cryptographers in the country were spending at least some of their time working on the Beale papers. But despite the hours and the brain power exerted, the first and third pages of the Beale papers have never been decoded. How did Thomas Beale do it? How could a sunburned cowboy have created a code so unbreakable that has withstood so many attempts to reveal it. The same minds that invented the computer and the internet couldn't break his code. So there's a few theories out there. One theory is that maybe no one can break the book cipher because Beale based it on a book he wrote himself. Maybe it was so worth it to him to protect the treasure that he wrote two copies of a book or a long essay and gave one copy to a friend and kept the other one, and then both copies were lost. Because unlike most code makers who are sending messages during wartime and have to communicate quickly, Thomas Beale would have had all the time in the world to get ready to write his book cipher. A second theory is maybe the author deliberately sabotaged the code. This is what some people think. I think maybe he hoped that someone who had received the key from Beale would contact him 
after the pamphlet was published. And then he could um, draw that person's attention and crack the real code, which he kept to himself. But maybe, people, some people believe, the code has been broken and the treasure has been found, but whoever kept it, a, whoever found it, kept it a secret and never told the world. So that's the story of the Beale treasure. That's as much as we know so far. I hope you enjoyed this story, McLaren, and I hope you all have a great day.